Greetings. Before we open God's word and have a word of prayer to ask for the Lord to bless us, I'd like to say that I wish all of the problems were like this one. <laughs> we should have gotten a tent <laughs> and had a good old-fashioned camp meeting. How about it? I'm trying to plant this idea in the minds of the organizers. <laughs> Love camp meeting. I'd like to mention that uh, I've been very, very impressed with what's happening at this institution. This is the first time that I've been here. I had had uh, people tell me about it. I'd seen pictures of it. But now my eyes behold. And I like what I'm beholding. Any funds that are invested in this institution are funds well invested. And I was telling uh, Brother Restrepo, whom I've known since he was a little boy, <laughs> I said, your goal is pathetic. $50,000 with all these people here? we should be able to raise much more than that. You know, all, Ellen White says it, all that Noah had, he invested in the ark. Everything he invested in the ark. Everybody else was saving for a rainy day. <laughs> and what happened when the rainy day came? It swept it all away. So, you know, if you didn't put your donation in, I'm going to pledge $1,000. And I'm not a rich man. I'm going to put my money where my mouth is. And I hope that uh, those who have not maybe put in a couple of bucks or something like that, that we'll retread, rethink, and uh, give a sacrificial donation. We're forming young people for the future of this church. And we want to help this institution grow. I have a church member who was longing to come to Heartland with me. His name is Peter Chan. He's a strong supporter of Heartland. Unfortunately, last spring he passed away with pancreatic cancer. He was 71 years old. He was in phenomenal shape, it looked like. You know, he exercised, he had a vegan diet. Things like this happen and we can't understand them in this life. But we will in the future life. And I know that he would have liked to have been here. And I know that he would have given a significant donation to this institution. So let's do what we can to help. Now I'd like to invite you to bow your heads with me as we ask for the Lord's blessing. And there's a little ring in the sound, a little reverb, so maybe we can adjust that during the prayer. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, what a privilege it is to be here gathered on this wonderful Sabbath day. We know that you are present here. We can feel it in the air. And we know that the Bible says that where there are two or three gathered in your name, Jesus is there. So we can claim the Bible promise of your presence. And at this moment, we ask for your presence in a very special way. Lord, manifest your power as we open your word. That it might not return unto you void, but it might accomplish the work for which you sent it. And we thank you, Father, for the privilege of approaching your throne boldly. And we know that you have answered because we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. As I was mentioning last evening, there are many churches in the world. In fact, there are over 33,000 Protestant denominations in the United States. 
So why did God call our church into existence? What is the reason for our existence? Are we just like any other church? Or does God have a special reason for having called us out of darkness into his marvelous light? I'd like to begin by reading a statement that we find in volume 9 of the Testimonies, page 19, where Ellen White speaks about the unique relevance of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in these last days. I quote, in a special sense, Seventh-day Adventists have been set in the world as watchmen. Now that's a defensive job, isn't it? It's to defend. So she says, Seventh-day Adventists have been set in the world as watchmen and light bearers. That's the offensive part. Defense and offense. She continues saying, to them has been entrusted the last warning for a perishing world. On them is shining wonderful light. That's an awesome privilege. Wonderful light from the Word of God. They have been given a work of the most solemn import. That's the responsibility. Now what is that task that God has given us? She continues saying they have been given a work of the most solemn import, the proclamation of the first, second, and third angel's messages. There is no other work of so great importance. They are to allow nothing else to absorb their attention. Nothing else other than proclaiming the three angels' messages to the world. That is the reason why God raised up the Seventh-day Adventist Church. You see, we have a unique mission. We have a unique message, and we have a unique method. And that's what I would like to discuss during the minutes we have together this morning. Let's talk, first of all, about the mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Our mission is to go to all the world. I want to read two verses that we find in Scripture which clearly define our mission as going to every nation on planet Earth. Both of these verses are very well known, I'm sure, to all of us. The first of these is found in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 14. And here Jesus is speaking. Actually speaking through Matthew, but Jesus said these words before this. So we know that it is in, it is in the heart of Christ. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations and then the end will come. Our mission is to reach the world. Once again it says, the gospel will go to all of the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. The first angel's message in Revelation chapter 14 verse 6 begins by stating basically the same thing. We find there, and this was our scripture reading this morning, then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Our mission is to reach every nation on earth with the everlasting gospel. But what is our message? Well, you say the everlasting gospel is our message. But every church in the world claims that God has called them to preach the everlasting gospel to the world. Isn't that true? Do the Baptists believe that? Do the Methodists believe that? Do the Presbyterians believe that? Even do Charismatics believe that? Absolutely, they believe that they're supposed to go to the world and preach the gospel. 
But the Seventh-day Adventist Church has not only the mission to go to the, all of the world, but it has a special message for these last days, the gospel in a special context. The gospel in the context of the end time. I want you to notice Revelation chapter 14 and verses 6 through 12 are the message that God has given the Seventh-day Adventist Church for this time. You see, most people outside stop at verse 6 and they say, yeah, our role is to take the everlasting gospel to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, but we need to continue reading. Because verse 7 gives additional details about what the gospel involves. Now before we go there, I want to summarize some very important information about the three angels' messages. First of all, we know that the three angels' messages are God's last message to the world. You say, how do we know that the three angels' messages are God's last message to the world? It's very simple, because as soon as the third angel proclaims his message, Jesus is sitting on a cloud, and the righteous and the wicked are divided already into two groups. In other words, the very next event after the third angel proclaims his message is the harvest. And you say, what is the harvest? Well, the harvest technically is not the second coming of Christ. The harvest is the close of probation. In fact, in Christ's Object Lessons, page 72, Ellen White, speaking about the parable of the tares and the wheat, says the tares and the wheat are to grow together until the harvest, and the harvest is the end of probationary time. So in other words, immediately after the third angel's message, all of the world is divided into two groups, probation closes. That shows that these messages are the last message of God to planet earth. The second point that I want us to notice is that the three angels' messages are accompanied by the power of the latter rain. You say, how do we know that these messages are accompanied by the power of the latter rain? It's very simple. As soon as the third angel finishes proclaiming his message, the Bible says that the harvest of the earth is ripe. And the grapes of the earth are ripe. Let me ask you, what was it in Israel that ripened the harvest? The latter rain. And so we know that the latter rain accompanies these three messages because these three messages ripen the world either for salvation or for destruction. So they're God's last message to the world. They are accompanied by the power of the latter rain. But there's another point which I've already mentioned and I'm going to underline again. And that is that these three messages will polarize the world into two groups. One group will receive the seal of God, and the other group will receive the mark of the beast. In other words, the purpose of these messages at the very end of time is to lead everyone in the world to make a decision for God or for the beast. How important then are these messages? They are a matter of life and death. This is the reason why in early writings, pages 258 and 259, Ellen White, inspired by God's Spirit, had this to say, Woe to him who shall move a block or stir a pin of these messages. The true understanding of these messages is of vital importance. And then she says, The destiny of souls hangs upon the manner in which they are received. It is a matter of life and death. They will mature the world into two groups. Those who have the seal of God and those who have the mark of the beast. So let me ask you, how important is the message of the Seventh-day Adventist Church? It is a matter of life and death. Folks, we cannot be preaching what other churches are preaching. Now, they have truths that are beautiful truths that we preach. There's nothing wrong with that. But we have a unique and special message for this time. Ellen White calls it the message for this time. She also refers to it, as we spoke last night, as present truth. 
The three angels' messages are present truth. Now what do the three angels' messages contain? What are the elements of this message that God sends to the world at the end of time? The first angel's message actually gives us God's last message to the world in three commands. Have you ever, ever noticed that the first angel's message has three imperatives? What does it say? Fear God. In the Greek that is an imperative, which means that it's a command. So the everlasting gospel commands human beings to what? Fear God, that's not a cheap gospel. And then there's another imperative, give glory to Him. And then it explains why we are to fear God and give glory to Him, because the hour of His judgment has come. And then there's a third imperative which says, worship Him who made the heavens, the earth, the seas, and the fountains of waters. So the first angel's message actually has God's positive message for the world. What the world is supposed to do, it's supposed to fear God, give glory to God, worship the Creator, because the hour of God's judgment has come. Now the second angel's message follows in sequence to the first. I don't know whether you've noticed, but in Revelation 14 it says, a second angel followed him, and then a third angel followed him. So the three angels' messages must be given in their proper order. Don't try to convince people about the mark of the beast before you go to the first angel's message. Because it's not going to make sense to them. You see, after you have proclaimed the first angel's message to fear God and give glory to God, and that we're in the hour of God's judgment, and that we're supposed to worship the Creator, then people are going to say, now wait a minute. None of those things are being done where I am. And so now a second angel proclaims Babylon is fallen. And do you know why Babylon is fallen? Because she rejected the first angel's message. And instead of the first angel's message, she gives her wine to all nations, which is the opposite of the first angel's message. And so when this message is intensified in Revelation chapter 18, we find that God not only says Babylon is fallen, but God gives a call. He says, come out of her, my people. So the second angel's message has the intention of saying, listen, in Babylon, God is not feared, He's not given glory, and He is not worshipped on the basis of His holy Sabbath, which is the sign of His worship. Therefore, don't stay where you're at. Come out. That's part of the three angels' messages. And then the third angel's message follows the second and is a warning. And it says, if you don't come out, this is what's going to happen. You will drink the unmingled wrath of God. And I know that it's not popular to talk about God's wrath. Let me ask you, is this third angel's message a message of love? It's a strong message, though. It says whoever worships the beast or his image, or receives his mark, will drink the wrath of God unmixed with mercy, and will be tormented with fire and brimstone. How could that be a message of love? Let me tell you how it's a message of love. Because God doesn't want anyone to end up there. You know, it's like we warn our children. We say, before you cross the street, look both ways, or else you're going to be splattered all over the road. Is that a message of love? Oh, but it's gory. Yeah, but you want to make a point. You want them to say, look both sides, so that they don't end up splattered all over the road. And so the third angel's message, God is saying, get out. He says, the second angel's message, get out. But if you don't get out, the plagues will fall upon Babylon. So don't stay in there. Get out. Now let me summarize the content of the three angels' messages, particularly the first angel's message. I'm going to synthesize 25 hours into two minutes. 
I did a series where I studied phrase by phrase the three angels' message. Phrase by one sermon for every phrase in Revelation chapter 14. But I'm going to synthesize the content of the first angel's message. Because that is the message, the unique message of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. First of all, we are told to fear God. What does it mean to fear God? Does it mean that we're afraid of God? No. It means that we have a deep and profound respect for God that is manifested in obedience. We respect and love God so much that we are willing to obey Him no matter what it costs. In fact, if you look in the Old Testament at the expression fear God or at the expression the fear of the Lord, you're going to find that usually it is linked with keeping God's commandments. And by the way, it's linked with the judgment too. For example, Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 13 says, Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every work into judgment. Do you see the connection? Fear God, give glory to Him. But in Ecclesiastes it says, Fear God and keep His commandments because of the judgment. And that's only one example. Multiple times in the Old Testament, the fear of God is linked with keeping God's holy law as a sign of respect to Him as the great and awesome God. The second angel's message is to give glory, the second phrase in the first angel's message is to give glory to God. What is God's glory? His glory is His character, folks. Moses said to God on Mount Sinai, Show me your glory. And what did God show him? His character. And so giving glory to God means to reveal His character to the world. And then you have the third imperative which says worship the Creator. Now listen carefully. We usually apply that exclusively to the Sabbath. We say, yes, you know, worshiping the Creator, we have to worship on the day that He established as a sign of the Creator. We're supposed to worship on the Sabbath. And I agree with that. But there's much more involved in this than just worshiping on the Sabbath. What the first angel's message is telling us is that we need to restore everything that the Creator made at the beginning. We are to restore the Sabbath absolutely as the sign of the Creator. But we are supposed to also restore marriage as God established it at the beginning. And we are to restore health reform as it was at the beginning. And we are to restore the roles of men and women in the home and in the church as it was in the beginning. So it means restoring, Ellen White says, that in the end time we will restore every divine institution, without exception. And so the first angel's message is very embracing. It's saying, be obedient to God's commandments because you love Him. It's saying, reveal His character of love to the world. It's saying, uh, you know, worship the Creator. Go back to God's original plan. You know, God doesn't want us to adopt a plan B. Or a plan that is, that, that is not in harmony exactly with His will, where He gives some leeway to the church. Come on, folks. You remember Jesus once had a debate over the issue of marriage. The individual had been married several times. Jesus says, who will be the spouse in the resurrection? Jesus says, listen, you err not knowing the scriptures or the power of God. You remember that episode? Jesus also, in Matthew chapter 19, we're not going to go there, had a debate with the religious leaders where the religious leaders were saying, listen, Moses allowed us to get divorced for any reason. And what did Jesus say? Because of the hardness of your hearts, God gave you a plan B. <laughs> but what was the standard that Jesus raised up? He said, but at the beginning it was not so. What is the standard that Jesus wants to take us back to? To the beginning. Did he want to take people back to the standard of the Sabbath at the beginning? He had all kinds of controversy over the Sabbath. He wanted to restore the Sabbath as God established it at the beginning. And he wanted to establish marriage as God established it at the beginning. And roles within marriage as God established it at the beginning. And so all of this is included in the first angel's message. So folks, the three angels' messages basically are sequential. First message says, 
fear God by keeping His commandments, reveal the loving character of God to the world, worship God by reinstituting all of the institutions that were established by God at the beginning that have been distorted by man. And then the second angel says, Babylon has fallen because she doesn't do any of this. Instead, she gives her wine to the nations. Her wine are her false doctrines, by the way. Instead of the first angel's message, she gives the wine. And so the second angel says, listen, that's no place to be. Get out. And then the third angel says, you know, if you don't get out, there's going to be two groups. Those in Babylon and those who belong to the remnant. So our message is a message where people have to make a choice. On which side they are going to be. So that is our message. Our mission is to go to the entire world with the gospel. Our message is the distinctive message that we find in the three angels' message. But in order to share our message with the world, God has given the Seventh-day Adventist Church a special method of interpreting Bible prophecy. And I'm going to use Daniel 7, in Revelation 13 to illustrate the method. You see, if you have the method wrong, you will have the message wrong and you will have the mission wrong. The reason why the Christian world today is totally, totally oblivious to what's happening is because they have forgotten the method, the proper method of interpreting prophecy, which is not imposed on Scripture, but comes forth from Scripture. So let's take a review of Daniel 7. We're not going to study the whole chapter because I think most of us here know the contents of this chapter. In Daniel chapter 7 we have a lion. What does a lion represent? Babylon. Then after that we have a bear. What does a bear represent? Medo-Persia. After the bear we have a Leopard beast. What does the leopard beast represent? It represents Greece. By the way, is, are there any gaps in between these nations? Any parentheses? No. It's what I call the historical flow method. It's also called historicism. But when you use ism, it usually is a distortion. And so I like to call it the historical flow method because it begins in the days when the prophet wrote and then it fulfills without interruption or any gaps throughout the course of Christian history or, or history ending with the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now the third nation is Greece, the leopard. You have Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece. But then you have a fourth, a fourth power which is not described specifically as a dragon in Daniel 7. We call it the nondescript beast, but it really is a dragon. When you read the description, it's a dragon. And what I want you to notice is that this dragon beast has four consecutive stages of existence. Four stages of existence. You say, now how's that? Go with me to Daniel chapter 7, verses 23 and 24. We're studying the method. Daniel chapter 7 verses 23 and 24. It says there, speaking about this fourth beast, Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth. So what does the fourth beast represent? A fourth kingdom. And what kingdom is that that comes after Greece? The Roman Empire. Now, notice what it continues saying which shall be different from all other kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, trample it, and break it in pieces. So you have this dragon-like beast that represents the Roman Empire. When this beast rises, it has no horns. Later in its existence, it will sprout ten. And after the ten, it will sprout one. Three stages there. The dragon beast by itself, the dragon beast with the ten, and the dragon beast with the one. Let's continue reading. You'll see it. Verse 24. The ten horns are ten kings, now listen carefully, who shall arise from this kingdom. 
So did the kingdom exist before the ten horns arose? Of course, because it says the ten will arise from the kingdom. They can't arise from the kingdom unless the kingdom exists. And so the first stage of this dragon beast is the dragon beast by itself for a while. Then it sprouts ten horns, and then I want you to notice what it continues saying. Verse 24 again, the ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom, and another shall rise after them. Are you following me? What stage is that? Number three. The dragon beast by itself, the dragon beast with ten horns, and then the da dragon beast with the little horn. Let me ask you something. Are all of these stages Roman? How do we know that? Because they come from the head of the Roman beast. Hello. Do the ten horns come from the head of the fourth beast? Does the little horn come forth from the head of the beast? Of course. So all of these stages are stages of Rome. And of course we know, folks, we know that um, Rome at first existed as a kingdom without any divisions. But then it was divided as a result of the barbarian uh, invasions. And then after the barbarian invasions another horn arose which was a different Rome, it was the Roman Catholic Papacy. So how many stages do we have so far? We've got three stages so far. Now let me share something very important with you. I might be getting a little ahead of myself, but um, that's okay, we'll come back to it a little bit later. What does the dragon represent in the prophecy of Daniel 7? And by the way, Revelation chapter 12 also. Satan. I'll give you half credit for that. <laughs> yeah, Revelation 12 says that the dragon is the devil and Satan. But listen carefully to what I'm going to say. The dragon represents Satan working through Rome. Whenever the dragon appears, the dragon is connected with Rome. Let me ask you, what was the power? It says the dragon stood next to the woman to devour her child as soon as it was born. What did that dragon who wanted to kill the child, what does it represent? Do you think Satan stood next to, next to Mary to try and devour her child? No. Who did the devil use to try and destroy Christ? A ruler of Rome. Then we're told that the woman fled to the wilderness and she's persecuted by the dragon. For 1260 years. What does the dragon represent there? Satan working through papal Rome. Now listen, this is a point that most commentators in the Adventist church have missed. In Revelation 13 it speaks about another beast that rises from the earth. And it has two horns like a lamb, but it speaks like a dragon. Which must mean that this beast that rises from the earth is going to speak like Rome. Are you following me? It is going to be a spokesperson for Rome. Because all the way through the dragon represents Rome. So we have three stages so far. Let's review. We have Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, pagan Rome, Divided Rome, then you have the little horn, and how long does the little horn rule? 1,260 years, which end at what date? 1798. Have you seen that we've studied the broad sweep of history without any interruptions? No parentheses, no breaks. One nation follows another in the sequence. This is the historical flow method. You know exactly where you are at each moment as you interpret the prophecy. It's known as historicism. But I mentioned that there's a fourth stage to the beast. Now in order to understand the fourth stage of the beast, we need to go to Revelation 13 because Daniel 7 doesn't make it clear. Daniel 7 basically uh, takes you to the point when the little horn ruled 1260 years and that's it. 
Well, it does take you to the judgment and the second coming. But it doesn't say clearly that the, that the little horn has another stage of existence. But when you go to Revelation 13, it's clear. You see, in Revelation 13, you have a beast that rises from the sea. This beast represents the same thing as the little horn. You say, how do we know that? It's very simple. We know that because the beast does the same things as the little horn did. Does the beast persecute the saints of the Most High? Yes. It does. Does it speak blasphemies against the Most High? Does it rule for 42 months? Yes. The same time period. Yes, we know the beast is the same as the little horn. Now what happens when the, after the beast rules for 42 months, what happens to the beast? It receives a deadly wound. That's not explicitly in Daniel 7. See, that's why we need Revelation. Revelation amplifies what we find in the book of Daniel. And so at the end of the 1260 years, this little horn receives a deadly wound. The beast receives a deadly wound. And as a result, there is a period of what? Of inactivity for the beast or for the little horn. We are now in that period of inactivity which is not going to last very long. But the same prophecy, listen, the same prophecy tells us that after a period of inactivity of this little horn or this beast, its deadly wound will be healed. Is that another stage of Rome? That's the fourth stage of Rome. After a period of respite, it will rise to power again, and it will do again what it did in the past. Now, we need to go to Revelation 13 and review something else. Have you seen the sequence? Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire divided the little horn 1260 years, and then period of inactivity, the deadly wound is healed, and it does what it did in the past. But in between when the deadly wound is given and when the deadly wound is healed, another beast rises from the earth. <laughs> this beast is contemporaneous with the first beast. It lives at the same time as the first beast. And as the first beast is a world superpower, the second beast is also a world superpower. What does this beast represent? It is a beast that rises from the earth. Listen carefully. It cannot be, it cannot rise in Asia or in Europe. Because the beast that arose in Asia and Europe rose from the sea. And this one rises from the earth, a different place. Because if it was rising in Europe or in Asia, it would be, it would be said that it was rising from the sea. But it's rising in a different place from the earth. And we can't take the time to give all of the characteristics. But there's one characteristic that I especially want to focus on. This beast that rises from the earth rises when the first beast falls. When did the first beast fall? 1798. Let me ask you, when did the United States rise to power as the first beast was falling? Absolutely. It's, it's, it can be proven historically. That when that first beast received his deadly wound, the United States was rising. In fact, you look at the history of the United States, Declaration of Independence, 1776, Constitution, 1787, the Bill of Rights, 1791. Seven years later, the deadly wound. God was already raising the United States to power as the other one was about to fall. Without a gap or a parenthesis. Are you with me? This is historicism. And we're told that this, that this beast that rises from the earth has two horns like a lamb. It is not a lamb-like beast. <laughs> it is a beast that has lamb-like horns. And do you know what those two horns represent? They represent civil and religious liberty. You can call it also separation of church and state. 
It's a nation where two kingdoms are recognized because horns represent kingdoms. The United States recognized the legitimate existence of the state and the legitimate existence of the church, not together but separate. The two kingdoms that Jesus recognized. Render therefore to Caesar that which is Caesar's, and to God that which is God's. Jesus, the Lamb of God, taught what those two horns like a lamb are like. They are two kingdoms. And by the way, from the two kingdoms of the church and the state, is the church called a kingdom? I told Peter, I will give you the keys of the kingdom. The church is the kingdom. It's the kingdom that's not of this world. Is the state a kingdom? So in the United States, you have two kingdoms that exist together, separate, one from another. And so for a time, this beast that rises from the earth, everything is going well. I mean, during the inactivity of this first beast, this second beast is guaranteeing religious liberty, civil liberty, it's separating church and state. But then suddenly, this beast has a change of character. I wrote a book called Prophecies Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. <laughs> because this beast has a dual personality. It's, it says one thing, but it does another. Now, let me emphasize this point. This beast is different than all of the previous beasts. Because the previous beast had to fight the beast before it to gain power. The bear had to fight the lion. The leopard had to fight the bear. The dragon beast had to fight the leopard. However, this beast that rises from the earth does not fight the previous power, but helps the previous power recover its power. Do you know that everything that this beast from the earth does, it does with reference to the first beast? Let me just share with you. Scripture tells us that it exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence. So by whose authority is this beast from the earth exercising? The, the, the authority of the first beast. He's helping the first beast. And by the way, that expression, in his presence, is translated, in other versions, on his behalf. Which I believe is an accurate translation. And as you continue reading, it says that it speaks like a dragon. What was the previous power? Satan working through Rome. So if this beast is going to speak like a dragon, it's speaking like Rome, the previous power. Furthermore, everything that this beast does, he does to help the first beast. It says that he commands everyone to worship the first beast. He sets an image of the first beast. And he commands everyone on pain of death to receive the mark of the beast. In other words, we're, look, we're to look for a power in this world that at first guaranteed civil and religious liberty for a period of time while this first beast was inactive, but then its character changes and it helps the first beast to recover its power. You know, and as a result, persecutions will begin again, like during the Dark Ages. Now listen carefully, folks. It's been, become popular in the Adventist church to say that the deadly wound was healed in 1929. I'm not saying that, the, that 1929 was not significant. But the wound was not healed in 1929. Because after 1929, the whole world did not marvel after the beast. An image of the beast was not made. And the bark, mark of the beast was not imposed. Are you with me? Scripture tells us that the nation that will, that will restore the power of the first beast was not going to be Italy in 1929, but the United States. When the United States joins church and state, it will be an image of what the papacy was. 
and as a result the papacy will recover its power to persecute. This is the historical flow method. Is it simple? Piece of cake. To use an expression that my marketing de director always uses. Whenever I ask her to do something, she says, ah, piece of cake. And in five minutes, it's done. <laughs> so you have Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, the Roman Empire, the ten kingdoms of the divisions of the Roman Empire, the little horn, the papacy, 1260 years, 1798. Then the beast rises from the earth, a period of inactivity, as long as church and state are separated. And then the deadly wound is healed by this beast from the earth, and persecution begins again. Let me ask you, where are we in this flow of history? We are at the end of the period of inactivity of the first beast. Now listen carefully to what I'm going to say. There is a strong push by charismatic Protestants in the United States to unite with the papacy. What's remarkable to me in all of this is that it is not Catholics who are making overtures to the papacy. It is Protestants who are making overtures to the Roman Catholic papacy. Now, do you know that the method that the Seventh-day Adventist Church uses to interpret Bible prophecy is the method that was used by the Protestant reformers? They used historicism. But the churches they, they founded have gone astray from the method. In fact, they use this very method to identify the papacy as the Antichrist of Scripture. They just could follow the flow. And they pointed out clearly by the characteristics that the papacy, the harlot, the man of sin, the little horn, the beast, they said all of the characteristics are there. Speaks blasphemies against the Most High, persecutes the saints of the Most High, has ruled for over a thousand years. It's very, very clear, they said. You can identify who it is. Sits in the temple of God, which is the church, claiming to be God. It's all there. And so the papacy started losing na entire nations in Europe to Protestantism. And so they said, we need to do something about this. But they soon realized that it would not be sufficient to attack the Protestant message. They had to attack the Protestant method. And by getting rid of the method, they would get rid of the message. And therefore, two Jesuit scholars in the Counter-Reformation. By the way, if you want to read more about this, I wrote a book called Futurism's Incredible Journey, where I trace all of the history. It's an amazing history. It'll make you cry. Roman Catholic Church, after the Council of Trent, there arose a Roman Catholic scholar by the name of Luis de Alcázar, Jesuit from Spain. And he established a system, wrote a commentary, 900-page commentary, where he established a method which is known as preterism. He said, no, no, no. These Antichrist prophecies, they don't point to the Roman Catholic system. Actually, the little horn prophecy was fulfilled with an individual who lived 165 years before Christ, whose name is Antiochus Epiphanes. You know, he desecrated the Jewish temple, he sacrificed a pig on the altar, and, uh, you know, he ruled for three years, but that's close enough. And so, so the little horn prophecy was fulfilled with Antiochus Epiphanes, B.C. And as far as the beast of Revelation 13, that represents Nero, the emperor Nero. And so what has happened? The Antichrist prophecies have been projected to the distant past, therefore they have no relevance with the Roman Catholic Church. By the way, the Roman Catholic Church uses preterism as its method. And the liberal Protestant churches as well. You know, if a church has the name United before it, more likely than not it's a liberal church. United Methodists, United Presbyterians, United Lutherans, United Church of Christ. It's a unity not on the basis of truth, 
but on the basis of culture, what people want. And by, by the way, that's the reason why these churches are dwindling quickly. Now, another Jesuit scholar arose by the name of Francisco Rivera, also a Jesuit from Spain. And he disagreed with Luis del Alcázar. He said, no, 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 uh, the Antichrist prophecies have not been fulfilled yet. They will be fulfilled in the future when the Jerusalem temple is rebuilt. And then a nasty individual will sit in the Jewish temple. He'll make a great big statue of himself. And he will command all of the Jews in the Middle East to come and to worship the image of himself. And he will put a tattoo on people. And so basically what Francisco Rivera taught is that the, the Antichrist prophecies, the little horn, the beast, no, 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 that has nothing to do with Christian history. That's going to be fulfilled in the future. And then Protestants added the idea that before all of this literal stuff happens, and he rules for three and a half literal years in the literal Jewish temple, uh, and he persecutes the literal Jews, and he reestablishes the literal sacrifices, they say, you know, but before that happens, the church is going to be raptured to heaven. And so as a result, everybody is looking for, to the future for the beast. And everybody is looking to the past for the beast. And meanwhile, the beast is in Rome and is helper in the United States and people can see it because they're looking in the wrong place. How important, folks, is our method? What the devil is trying to do by changing the method is hiding the powers that will play a role in Bible prophecy in the end time. You see, if you don't get the beast right, you will not get the image of the beast right, and you will not get the mark of the beast right. So by changing the method, the devil says that's much more efficient than changing the message. And we have Adventist pastors who make you cry. An Adventist pastor just posted an article, somebody shared with me last night, on Spectrum, where he lambasts the Seventh-day Adventist view of the second beast of Revelation 13. He says that the pioneers were simply paranoid when they said that the United States was going to become a persecuting power. How can Adventist ministers be so blind that they're not able to follow a simple sequence that Scripture makes clear? Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Roman Empire, Roman Empire divided, Papal Rome ruling 1260 years, deadly wound, period of inactivity, a beast rises that guarantees civil and religious liberty. After a period of inaction, this beast from the earth uses its power and authority to restore the first beast to power. Simple. It's not rocket science. You don't have to be King Solomon to understand it. Or you don't have to be Albert Einstein either. Now let me share you some things, share with you some things that are happening in the ecumenical world. Some of these things you've heard about. You ever heard of Tony Palmer? Let me tell you something about Tony Powell. By the way, he, he was killed in a motorcycle accident a few days ago. Makes you wonder. You see, he belonged to a church that is seriously fragmented with offshoots. The Anglican Church. He was an Anglican uh, clergyman of the Celtic tradition. The Anglican Church has, has bunches of splinters. And so he yearned for unity among Christians. He wanted Christians to have a common experience. And so he was invited to go to a convention that was organized by Kenneth Copeland. Any of you ever heard of Kenneth Copeland? One of the foremost charismatic preachers on television. This happened on February 25, 2014. Very recent. He was invited to speak at Kenneth Copeland's training session for charismatic leaders. Representatives from thousands of churches were present there. 
He got up and he said, I have come in the spirit of Elijah to bring the hearts of the sons to the fathers and the fathers to the sons. In other words, God has raised me up to unite all Christians. Then he lamented that after Luther, 33,000 Protestant denominations have appeared. And this led him to say that diversity is divine and division is diabolic. Listen carefully. God believes in unity and diversity, but not of theology. Yes, of gender. Yes, of nationality. Yes, of race. Yes, of occupation. Yes, of social status. Unity and diversity. But never did Jesus say unity and diversity of theology or of doctrine. He went on to say that God has given charismatics the glory that they may be one. And I want, to do, I want to read as he expressed what glory is. He said, it is the glory that glues us together, not doctrine. It's the glory. If you accept that the glory of God is living in me, and the presence of God is in you, that's all we need. Because God will sort out all our doctrine later upstairs. You think? And then he referred to something that was um, approved in 1999 between Lutheran and Catholic theologians. It's known as the Joint Declaration of Righteousness by Faith. Basically, they signed a declaration that Lutherans and Catholics agree on righteousness by faith. Five years later, the Methodists signed that same declaration. And so he says, Luther's Reformation call was righteousness by faith. And so because Catholics and, 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 and Lutherans agree on righteousness by faith, the protest is over. What he failed to tell you is that the clarion call of the Reformation was not righteousness by faith, it was sola scriptura. And righteousness by faith was a doctrine that was, that was derived from the belief that we go by what the Bible alone says. He said, I lament that no evangelical church has signed this agreement. Then he stated, the protest has been over for 15 years. And then comes the significant aspect. He says, if there is no longer any protest... How can there be a Protestant church? Maybe now we are all Catholics again. Now Palmer was a close friend of Francis I, the Pope. And before he went to the convention, he taped a iPhone message to share with the Protestants at the convention. And so, when Tony Palmer went to Kenneth Copeland's convention, you need to understand these are charismatic leaders from all over the world. This isn't just one little local convention. He was allowed to play the message that the Pope sent to all of these charismatic leaders. And I want to share some of it with you. The Pope stated, I am yearning that this separation comes to an end and gives us communion. I am yearning for that embrace. At the very end of his message, the Pope said in his iPhone message, please pray for me. I need your prayers. And I will pray for you. But I need your prayers. And let's pray to the Lord that he unites us all. Come on, we are brothers. Let's give each other a spiritual hug. And let God complete the work that he has begun. And this is a miracle. The miracle of unity has begun. I ask you to bless me. I bless you. From brother to brother, I embrace, I embrace you. And then Kenneth Copeland went to the stage. Repeating bunches of times, glory, 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 glory. Kind of like they do in the songs these days that Christian has been talking to us about. Trying to psych himself up. As he went up, the people clapped, stood up. And then Kenneth Copeland said, We do not know how to pray for him as we ought. 
the Pope requested prayer. So we don't know how to pray. And so then he started uttering a prayer in tongues. And after he had prayed a long prayer in tongues, he said to Tony Palmer, come up here and bring your, bring your iPhone because we want to send a message to the Pope. And this is part of the message that he sent to the Pope. These leaders represent literally tens of thousands that love you, that believe that God is with you. And in answer to your request, we have just prayed for you and with you, and we did so in the Spirit. We do bless you. We receive your blessing. These are Protestants. It is very, very important to us. And we bless, now notice the verse that he's using to address the Pope. And we bless you with all our hearts, we bless you with all our souls, we bless you with all our might. Mercy, mercy. And we thank you, sir, we thank God for you. And so, all of us declare together, be blessed. Let me ask you something. If Protestantism had kept the method of interpreting prophecy, would this have happened? Do you think the Protestants would want to unite with Roman Catholicism if they truly followed the method, the proper method of interpreting Bible prophecy? They would not want to touch the papacy with a 10-foot pole or a 100-foot pole, for that matter. James Robeson, ever heard of James Robeson? Another television preacher with a large following went to visit the Pope after the Tony Palmer affair. And this is what he said to the Pope. Pope Francis, let me just say to you that I see Jesus in you. And in Christ we are brothers. We are family. Thank you for speaking the language of love. That all may come to know him and love him and love one another. And then for the first time in history, Robeson through the translator said, explain to the translator what a high five is so that the translator would talk to the Pope and ask him if he would give him a high five. And so for the first time that we know of in papal history, the Pope gave a high five <laughs> to James Robeson. On James Robeson's program, May 5, his program Life Today, he had Tony Palmer as a guest. And Tony Palmer once again repeated, Diversity is divine, it is division that is diabolic. Then he said, Jesus' theology is, this. listen to this, that if God is in you, and you are in God, and God is in me, and I am in God, we are one together in God. Well, that's profound theology, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> then he stated this, our sin is that we don't make our unity visible because we allow our diversities to divide us. And if we elevate anything to divide us, we are elevating it above the cross. So whether it is a doctrine or a dogma or an expression, if you use that to divide our unity, you have elevated that doctrine or whatever it may be above the cross. And then he says, no, we are not saying put doctrine aside. Certainly not. So it sounds pretty good, but then he only accepts two doctrines. He continues saying, Pope Francis recognizes only two fundamental doctrines, love for God and love for your neighbor. End of doctrine. Another individual that visited the Pope was Joel Osteen. Ever heard of Joel Osteen? <laughs> he doesn't pastor a mega church, he pastors a giga church several services in, in a sports coliseum where the Houston Rockets used to play. 25, 30,000 each service on Sunday. I want to share some of the things he said. He said, I just felt very honored and very humbled to visit the Pope. He went on to say it was amazing. And even to go back into that part of the Vatican, because they took him to the back parts of the Vatican that most people don't see, he said, there's so much history there, you better believe there is. <laughs> there's so much history there. 
the place that they took us through, he says, you feel that deep respect and reverence for God. Osteen later attended a mass at St. Peter's Square where there were 100,000 people present. And then Osteen said, afterward the Pope spent an hour and a half going through the crowd with the Pope mobile greeting people. It was very heartwarming to see him caring for people. I love the fact that he's made the church more inclusive, he said. Not trying to make it smaller, but trying to make it larger. To take everybody in. So that just resonates with me. Have you ever heard of Ulf Ekman? Probably not. Ulf Ekman was the pastor of the largest charismatic church in Scandinavia in Sweden until March 9 of this year. I read from Christianity Today's uh, website a title that said Sweden's Pentecostal mega pastor converts to Catholicism. The subtitle read he stuns his word of life mega church in Sunday sermon he's crossing the Tiber the article says, just who is Ulf Ekman? He founded the 3,300 member megachurch in one of Sweden's largest cities. He operated the largest Bible school in Scandinavia. It has educated more than 9,500 students in the period of its existence. On Sunday, March 9, he announced to his stunned congregation that he was leaving his congregation to join the Roman Catholic Church. He stated that it would now be his objective to pursue the unity among all Christian movements and denominations. Then he went on to say, speaking about the reason, he says it really challenged our Protestant prejudices. So it's the Protestants who are prejudiced, of course. It really challenged our Protestant prejudices. And we realized that we, in many cases, did not have any basis for our criticism of them. We needed to know the Catholic faith better. This led us to realize that it was actually Jesus Christ who led us to unite with the Catholic Church. Then he also said this, We have seen a great love for Jesus and a sound theology founded on the Bible and classic Christian dogma. Another way of saying it is the Bible and tradition. We have experienced the richness of sacramental life. We have seen the logic in having a solid structure for priesthood that keeps the faith of the church and passes it on from one generation to another. Apostolic succession. He continues saying we have met an ethical and moral strength and consistency that dare to face up to the general opinion and a kindness towards the poor and weak. And last but not least, we have come in contact with representatives for millions of charismatic Catholics and we have seen their living faith. What do you think? Are we nearing the end of the period of uh, inactivity? How did Ellen White know this? Let me read you what Ellen White said 120 years ago. Lucky guess. Uh -uh. She had to be inspired. Great Controversy 445, we're, we're near the end. When the leading churches of the United States, uniting upon such points of doctrine as are held by them in common, shall influence the state to enforce their decrees and to sustain their institutions, then Protestant America will have formed an image of the Roman hierarchy and the infliction of civil penalties upon dissenters will inevitably result. Uniting upon common points of doctrine, she says. Page 444, she says, The wide diversity of belief in Protestant churches is regarded by many as decisive proof that no effort to secure a forced uniformity can be made. But there has been for years in churches of the Protestant faith 
a strong and growing sentiment in favor of a union based upon common points of doctrine. To secure such a union, the discussion of subjects upon which are all are not agreed, however important they might be from a Bible standpoint, must necessarily be waived. We are living on the threshold of the end of the end, folks. The world needs to know this. We are responsible to tell our relatives and our friends and our neighbors and our fellow workers in the correct way. Because this is our message. We need, do people need to know what the beast is? If they don't, they will end up worshiping the beast. Do they need to know what the image of the beast is? If not, they'll end up worshiping the image. Do they need to know what the mark of the beast is and the seal of God? Yes, it's, it's the third angel's message. Whoever worships the beast or his image or receives his mark. Folks, if we interpret prophecy like the preterists and the futurists, the third angel's message is irrelevant. I read one statement in closing. Signs of the Times, June 12, 1893. This is saddening. You know, sometimes I shed tears when I read this statement. When the land which the Lord provided as an asylum for his people that they might worship him according to the dictates of their own consciences. The land over which for long years the shield of omnipotence has been spread. The land which God has favored by making it the depository of the pure religion of Christ. When that land shall, through its legislators, abjure the principles of Protestantism and give countenance to Romish apostasy in tampering with God's law, it is then that the final work of the man of sin will be revealed. Protestant, now listen, who takes the initiative? We're seeing that today, aren't we? Protestants will throw their whole influence and strength on the side of the papacy by a national act. What is a national act? It's an act of Congress, folks. By a national act enforcing the false Sabbath now listen to the terminology. They will give life and vigor. What, what comes to your mind with they will give life and vigor? The papacy has a wound. So what are they doing? They're healing the wound. They're giving life and vigor. They will give life and vigor to the corrupt faith of Rome. Reviving. See? Because she has a deadly wound. Reviving her tyranny and oppression of conscience. Then it will be time for God to work in mighty power for the vindication of his truth. And we are responsible to share that truth. Let me end by telling you a story. Last year I was invited to go to New Jersey to speak at a church there. The lady who invited, my wife was with me, she travels with me once in a while. Um, the lady who invited us, invited us to her house to eat. So we went, she had a fantastic spread, Cuban food. Mm. I don't have breakfast on Sabbath, so <laughs> I can just about taste it now. But not only was my wife and myself there, but also there was a young man who I'd seen at the meetings in the evenings, but I didn't know who he was. And so he shared his testimony. So let me tell you the story of, of, of who I am and why I'm here said, I was standing on a street on a Sabbath morning, and I saw this lady walking down the street with a Bible in her hand, a black book. He assumed it was the Bible. And she was very nicely dressed about 9 o'clock in the morning. So he went up to her and he said, Ma'am, why are you going so well dressed on a Saturday morning? She says, I'm going to church. He said, what? People go to church on Sunday. She says, oh, not my church. My church keeps the Sabbath the way the Bible says. He says, really? He says, I've been studying the Bible. That's my conclusion too. Can I go with you to church? She said, of course. So both of them together went to church. And when he went into the foyer, I'm telling it just like he told it, they entered the foyer of the church. There was a greeter there. I think it was an elder. And this young man said to the, to the elder, is this the church where you keep the Sabbath? 
And the elder said, yes, this is the church where the Sabbath is kept. He says, well, then this is my church. So I sat down to listen to the sermon, and in the sermon, the preacher mentioned the name of Ellen G. White. And he said, you know, as Ellen G. White, through the spirit of prophecy, something along those lines, says in, in such and such a book. So this captivated this young man. He says, hmm, Ellen G. White. I'm going to check it out when I get home on the internet. <laughs> I can hear a groan. <laughs> so he went home. He looked on the internet and all of these wicked sites come out. Lambasting Ellen White, plagiarist, you know, she was in it for the money and she was, you know, she was schizophrenic and, you know, they say all kinds of evil things about Ellen White and almost all of the sites are negative and so, you know, he said, I thought to myself, is that the kind of church I want to belong to? But then he said this, I started thinking. I don't know of a single prophet in the Bible that the people liked. <laughs> so if people dislike this woman so much, she must have been doing something right. <laughs> and so he said to the elder of the church, do you have anything that's written by Ellen White? I want to read it. And the elder said, yes, I have a copy of Great Controversy. So gave him a copy of Great Controversy. He read it in a week. The next Sabbath he came to church with a smile on his face. He says, I believe that Ellen White was a prophet of the Lord. Amen. Because no mere human being could have written what I have read in this book. Amen. Folks, while Ellen White is being doubted in the church, <laughs> the people outside are seeing the light. And it is now time for us to take the great controversy, the full great controversy, Amen. and spread it like the leaves of autumn. Amen. Because the things in that book are happening now. Amen. That is our message and that is our mission. Amen. And it contains in all its glory our method. Amen. May the Lord bless us and help us to fulfill that for which God has called us. We hope you have been blessed by this message. If you would like more information about other programs or sermons by this speaker, please contact EGN at 1-800-774-3566. That's 1-800-774-3566. On behalf of the entire EGN team, thank you for watching.